So if you have a Bible, I'm going to give you a couple of passages of scripture that you can turn to. Uh, the first one is 1 Peter. Nope, that's wrong. 1 Timothy chapter 3. I actually read Timothy and said Peter. That's the skills that I have. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, and then also Genesis chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3, Genesis 3. So we're in a series where we're looking at this idea. The phrase in the Bible is holy, but whenever we hear holy, we think of rules that we have to follow. But that's not really what the Bible is talking about when it talks about holiness. It's this idea that God calls us and sets us apart to live life differently than the world. But what we've been examining is the life that God has set us apart to live is the best life possible, is the abundant life. So God wants us to experience life at its absolute best. But in order to fully understand that, there's a few things today that I want to set the foundation on so that we can build upon it today. And and here's the truth that we're going to begin with today is that in order to truly follow God, you have to follow his direction and timing. So when we look at this idea that God wants to set us apart to live the best life possible, here's what we need. This is where we have to begin. We will not naturally go there. If we were to follow the advice of our culture, which is to follow your heart, you need to understand your heart will not lead you to the abundant life that God offers. We are broken by sin. We are born into a broken condition. We currently live in a broken culture. And so if we follow what seems normal and natural to us until God changes that, if we follow what is normal and natural to us, it will never lead us toward the abundant life that God offers. So in order to experience what he's offering us, we have to have it set in our minds and hearts that we must follow both the direction and timing of God. And in case you've never heard this, this is a truth that the scripture communicates over and over. God speaks to us. God communicates to us. God leads us in our lives. So there will be moments where God will just, for whatever reason, just put something on our heart. There'll be times where God just puts a check in our spirit where we're about to make a decision and all of a sudden we can't really explain it. We just feel like we shouldn't. There are times that God speaks to us through other people. He speaks to us through his word. And in that moment, what God is showing us is the direction he wants our lives to go down, but not simply the direction. He also oftentimes gives us the timing. I remember, if, and many of you have heard my testimony at different times, but I remember when I was still in Detroit and God was just beginning the process of stirring my heart to leave Detroit to come here, I remember I was actually in California at a conference and I just couldn't even explain it. The person was speaking, he was, he was talking and he was sharing his testimony and in a moment I just sensed in my spirit, God said, get ready to take a step of faith, like be prepared to take a step of faith. And I knew in that moment it meant leaving where I was in Detroit, but I didn't know the next step. And so I prayed about it. That was in, in like early winter of that year. And I was praying about it and thinking about it, meditating. Then in May, all of a sudden, one day, and in a moment, I just felt like God said, today is the day. Get ready to take a step of faith. And the next day, we began the journey that ultimately led us here. It was God's direction, but it was also his timing. But in order to also really fully get this, we have to embrace something. It's a tension. In the next statement I'm about to make, if you don't have any context for it, it will sound like what I'm about to say is disrespectful of God, but I promise you it's not. When we look at the idea of following God's direction and timing, we have to also acknowledge this tension. God's ways are confusing and his timing is frustrating. Is that true? And and it looks like, again, if you're like new, you think, man, did you just insult God? No, not at all, not in any way. What I'm simply acknowledging is as God leads us, we don't have the perspective of God. We are looking at life through our own goals and desires and our own logic, what seems natural and normal to us. And oftentimes when God speaks to us and gives us a different direction and a different plan, we don't fully get the reason why. We don't have an eternal perspective. We don't have a complete understanding of what God is trying to do in our lives. And so when we look at what God's calling us to do, we have to acknowledge this tension. It is oftentimes confusing and oftentimes frustrating. Where we look at it and we think, I mean, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you just know it's God speaking, but there's a part of you going, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. You guys ever had that moment where you're like, I can't in any capacity figure out why this logically makes sense for me to do what you're calling me to do. And the reason why we have to acknowledge this tension is because this tension in our lives and how we respond to it will make all the difference of whether or not we experience this plan that God has for us, the best life that he has for us. 
And so there's another phrase that I want, or another word I want to put on the screen, and this is what I want to build on today. There's this critical condition of our minds and hearts that God is calling us to. And when we arrive at this place, it is the healthiest and safest place to be. But I'm going to be honest with you, it's something that we rarely get to. It's something that's difficult to get to. And here's the word, content. And when you hear that word, it, it might mean something to different ones. But when we're talking about being content, we're talking about being satisfied with God, being at peace with God, being whole in God. And the reason why this matters is being content with God means trusting God. And, and when we are content with God, when, and again, I'm not just talking about content in life because those can be two different things. You can have discontentment in life where you're just trying to figure things out, but you know that God's working a plan and you're content in God. But when you're content with God, what you're saying to God is, God, even though I don't fully understand everything, though my life might seem confusing and hectic or whatever, but God, I trust you. I'm complete in you. I, I, I'm at peace. I'm resting. I'm satisfied in you. And this is a very difficult place to get to because in our lives, what I've discovered, and I don't know if any of you who agree with me on this, is every time we get to a place of contentment with God, he's like, this is the perfect opportunity to make you take a step of faith, right? And all of a sudden, we have to wrestle with it again. Am I content still? Am I still content with you? Am I still satisfied in you? Do I still find my wholeness in you? And, and the way to really illustrate this truth, and I don't normally think this way or teach this way, but in order to illustrate this truth, I actually have to spend more time today in the negative of talking about what happens when we're the opposite of contentment. And so I'll give you one last foundational truth, and then we're going to build upon this today. Discontentment with God means distrusting God. And, and as you hear that, I, I want to be clear. That might sound like I'm just throwing shade at you or trying to shame you or guilt you because we all can recognize there are elements in our lives where we become discontent with God. Hear my heart, that's not at all what I'm trying to do. But what I'm trying to do is to get us to recognize a tension because this tension of discontentment, which happens in every single one of our lives, when we are discontent with God, we are opening up a dangerous door in our lives that can be manipulated and lead us down a, down a destructive path. And, and I know for me personally, if you were to look at the personality test that I've taken over the years, um, there's a consistent theme that you'll see in my personality. And one of the things that it always summarizes, it doesn't really matter the test that I take. And when it talks about my personality, it says that this type of personality hates to be manipulated or controlled. And I hate it. And like, I'm being honest, like the moment a person in my life, I even get a, a sense that they're trying to manipulate me. There is like an emotional shutoff that happens. I hate being controlled. I hate being manipulated. And yet, you know what? It happens. Like, I'll tell you a story. This is one of my favorite stories of manipulation because it turned out really good. Uh, years ago, uh, we were looking for a, a person to lead us in worship, a worship director. And uh, we, we couldn't find someone like in-house. And, and so we hired this company that helps churches out. And this company did a national search. It took many months and they finally came. And the person that was meeting with us came and he sat down. It was me and the, the pastoral team at the time. And he sits down at the table, conference table. And he has five different candidates that he's going to submit to us to look at, to look through their stuff. And he begins and he takes this folder and he says, oh, here's the first candidate, but you won't pick this person. And he puts it off to the side and he taps it. Well, immediately I was like, don't tell me what I'm going to take or not take, you know, like, and so like, that was like on my mind. And so he shows us the first candidate and I'm like, no, second, no, not a chance. Third, no, fourth one, no, let me see that one. I want to see that one. And, and so we looked at it, we loved it. And that's Pastor Michael, right? It was that candidate. Okay. So obviously an incredible manipulation. I'm glad he manipulated me, but it wasn't until like years later that I realized it. Years later, I'm literally one day just thinking about it. I might even been telling that story. And it was in that moment I went, Oh, I see it now. He came in and read something about my personality that he knew. I don't know if it's a rebelliousness in me or what, but he was like, I will manipulate this guy. This is a candidate you won't choose. And I had chosen Michael in that moment. You know what I mean? And so again, it turned out good. But in general, I hate being manipulated. But do you know what I also hate? I hate making bad decisions. Anyone else? Like, that's a no brainer, right? I hate making bad decisions. Uh, and I realized like the older I get and the more responsibility I have, 
my decisions come with consequences. And so as I was getting older, I started to realize that in my own life. As I got married, I realized that. As I'm a father, I realized that. As a pastor, I realized that. My choices have consequences. And so I hate making bad decisions. Okay, so I hate being manipulated. I, I hate making bad decisions. But here's something else I know, that there are certain conditions that I find myself in at times that tend to cause me to make bad decisions. Here's one. When I am hungry, I make bad decisions. There's a term for it. It's called hangry. I, that's, I, I know that. When I'm tired, I make bad decisions. When I'm stressed, when my feelings have been hurt, when I'm lonely, when I'm angry, whatever it might be. Anyone else agree with you that you had that same thing? Okay, so we recognize this. I don't want to be manipulated. I, I, I want to make good decisions, but there are certain conditions where I don't make the best decisions. This is the foundation of what we're talking about today. When we are discontent with God, this is a condition that will cause us to make bad decisions because we get manipulated in a spiritual way to go down a pathway we might not normally go down. And so as we look at this principle today, here's what I'm hoping will happen in our minds and hearts. I hope that we'll be open to evaluate where are we discontent in our lives? Are there areas that we're frustrated with God, confused by God? Are there areas that we just know we're striving really hard to try to fill a need that maybe God doesn't want filled in our lives right now? And as we look at this and look at the truths, I pray that the Spirit of God will speak to us and guide us and challenge us. So if you haven't already, turn to 1 Timothy chapter, I think I said chapter 3. It's actually chapter 6. Man, I, that was like a big miss on that one. Okay. 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is what the Apostle Paul says. And when he's talking about this, again, this is such a vivid explanation of the tension I'm talking about right now. But godliness with contentment is great gain. I'm going to end today by going back to this verse, but I want you just to to hear that. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So that's the context of what he's about to say. God wants us to be content, to be satisfied in him. He goes on and says, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. And then he starts to explain the tension. And in verse nine, he says, but those who desire to be rich, and let's just pause there. Let's acknowledge, Paul is 100% talking about money But what he's talking about is much more broad than just simply treasure or money. Uh, In the sense of like, if any of us were ever to say, I desire to be rich, here's what we're not saying. We're not saying, I desire to accumulate green pieces of paper. If someone loves money, they don't love green pieces of paper. They love what finances and wealth can bring to them. Are we all tracking with that? So when Paul says a person desires to be rich, he's talking about what those desires would lead to. That with money, we know this, we can have identity, we can have power, we can have influence, we can have comfort, we can have our desires met. And so all of those things, Paul's saying, when someone desires that, And we could even reverse it and look at it. And what Paul could be saying is when someone is discontent, because this is the context, he says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And now he's going to oppose that statement by saying, for those who are discontent, so as a result, they start to strive toward wealth and riches. He's then going to describe what happens. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people, in, people into ruin and destruction. What, what Paul just said, the person who is discontent opens themselves up to temptation. What is temptation? It is something that the spiritual forces, as, as scripture talks about, tries to lead us and manipulate us to walk away from what God has for us. And when does that happen? When a person is discontent, when a person in their life says, I need more, and we're gonna, again, go deeper into this in a moment. So he says, what happens is it leads them into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. He goes on, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving, again, just note the power of what he's saying here. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. 
Paul is describing the worst case scenario, that someone was once in a relationship with God, actively making decisions of faith, and because they grew discontent, that discontentment was manipulated through temptations and through desires to lead someone's life into ruin and destruction and away from a faith relationship with God. This is what Paul just described. And where did it begin? It began in discontentment. And, and I want us just to think about that. Here's the, I'm going to give you two truths today. Here's the first. Discontentment can lead to manipulation and control of your life even leading you away from faith in Jesus. This is what Paul just said. And I want you just to think about the moment, if you've had this experience, and I pray all of you have, the moment that you surrendered your life to Jesus, the moment of salvation, that moment when you just knew you had the conviction that Jesus was real, that you needed a savior, you felt his love, you had that powerful moment where you're like, yes, I am surrendering my life to Jesus. Here's what I can say with 100% certainty. No one in that moment ever envisioned a time where they would no longer be walking in a faith relationship with Jesus. No one in that moment thinks someday I'm gonna lose this conviction. Someday I'm gonna begin to make decisions that are gonna destroy my life. In that moment, you are firmly convinced that this will be the, the, the everlasting state of your mind and heart and spirit. You will trust in Jesus. And Paul goes, yeah, but what, you know what happens? Sometimes when we have discontentment in our lives and we start to run after these other things, it gets manipulated to the point that will actually lead you away from trusting in Jesus and to destroy your life. And if we were to even doubt this truth, all you need to do is open up your Bible like so many people do when they begin a reading plan and begin in Genesis, and it would take you about a day for you to get to a place that illustrates this clearly. If you don't know what I'm talking about, turn to Genesis chapter 3. And in Genesis chapter 3, it is this truth, the fall of humanity the beginning of all of our problems happens because of this truth. It says in verse one, so creation has taken place in, in chapters one and two, it gives a description of it. We really don't know how long after creation this next story takes place, but at some point it says this, and I wanna pause, just give you a little bit of context. God has created humanity. In, in Genesis one and two, it tells us Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are in the garden. God told them that they could eat of every single tree, including the tree of life, but there was one tree that he forbid them from eating, and that was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was God giving them a choice, uh, their free will. If they wanted to continue to trust God and follow God, they could obey him and not eat of this tree, but they could choose to reject him. But he told them with a warning that if you eat of this tree, it's gonna bring death into your life. And so that's a, the foundation. They're walking in obedience. And it says this in verse one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any, any other beast of the field that the Lord God has made. I wanna pause, this is a, a kind of an unusual story. In this story, the language that's being used is that of a serpent. When you really study scripture and look at this, more likely this is figurative language, actually talking about a spiritual being. I don't have time today to discuss all of that, but just note this, this is a spiritual conversation that's taking place. The serpent, more crafty than the other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made, he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. So one, God did not say that. So he begins to put the seed of distrust in her heart. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. That's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. So she explains, no, this is actually what God commanded. Okay. Note what the serpent says to her, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In this moment, the serpent sows a seed of distrust between the woman and God. And, and this is the rhythm of it. He says to the woman, first of all, God lied to you. God didn't tell you the truth. The second thing is that God didn't provide all that you actually need. And let's just be honest, he's actually keeping something good from you. So again, he says, God's lying to you. God's not providing for you. God's holding back something. 
And then he says to the woman, if you are going to have all that you need to survive and to thrive, you're going to have to get it yourself. And so he pl places this seed of discontentment inside the heart of Eve. And how does Eve respond? I want everyone to hear me the same way that all of us respond to discontentment. We, we respond as, oh, I have to fix this myself. This is what's natural to us. Verse 6, so after all of this, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So in this moment, the, the serpent sows a seed of discontentment inside her heart. He lies to her, he manipulates her, and it leads to her distrusting God, disobeying God, and it leads to, if you were to continue to read, the destruction of her and Adam's relationship. It leads to their destructive, destruction of the relationship with God. They feel shame. They feel vulnerability for the first time. They have separation. I mean, everything God had warned them about in that moment became true. And all of this was because Satan was offering her, actually he was saying to her, you can have a better life than you currently have. And what she immediately experienced was it actually was not better. And this is the same manipulation that Satan tries to do in each one of our hearts. This is the lie of discontentment. The lie of discontentment is this, you don't have what you need. Therefore, God didn't provide. Therefore, you must do it yourself. And this is a rhythm that if we're not purposed to recognize, we will naturally go down this pathway. We will be living our lives and then all of a sudden something that we want or something that we desire that we don't have and we'll think about it and we'll meditate on it and we'll start to research it, like whatever it is. And then we don't get it and we start to think, okay, well, if I don't have it, I, I need it. And if I need it and I don't have it, it's because God, you didn't provide this for me. And God, if you didn't provide this for me, then I'm gonna have to step in and do this myself. And that's how we fall into a, a pathway of temptation that leads us away from God because we've convinced ourselves if we don't have it and we need it, God has somehow failed us. But what if the actual truth is what we don't have, God knows we don't have and God's keeping it from us because he has something better for us. He has a better plan. And yet this is what we so often miss is that the whole lie of discontentment is just that. It's founded on a lie. For Adam and Eve, here was the truth. The life they had was the best life they could possibly experience. And what was being offered was very much a lesser quality life than what God was providing for them. But they needed to trust God. And all the problems of humanity can be traced back to this discontentment with God. And when we think about it in our own lives, we, we, we start to understand just the, the power of unmet desires. Let, let me illustrate it this way. If you are trying to eat healthy, when do you make your worst dietary decisions? Say it out loud. You know it. When you're hungry, right? Uh, how many of you have ever gone to the grocery store hungry and spent $7,000 in groceries, right? <laughs> I, I, this is not a made-up story. One time, years and years ago, I went to the grocery store starving, and I looked at a bag of dry beans, and it looked like, I was like, oh, that looks like that'd be great for dinner. <laughs> like, add some water to that, and mm, yeah, like, and I remember, like, looking by it going, like, I've never in my life had beans, dry beans, so it wasn't even something I experienced. It was just, like, in that moment when we're hungry, we make the worst dietary decisions, but think about it in other areas. Think about it in finances, when do we often make the worst financial decisions in our lives? It's when one, we so desire something that you go you know, to the car dealership or whatever it might be and you go in and all of a sudden you go in with a mindset, I'm gonna have this type of payment and you leave with a much higher payment and with the hope that if every single thing in my life works out perfectly, I'll be able to make that payment. Why? Because you had such great desire or the reverse of that, in emergencies, how many of us have made bad financial decisions because we had an emergency situation? Something broke and all of a sudden, like, I just got to get this fixed or I just need a car, I just need this. And so we go and because of that, that great moment of desire or emergency or discontentment, we make a bad financial decision. The same thing in relationships. I, I say this not at all to throw shame, 
But the people I see that make the worst romantic decisions in their lives oftentimes do it from a place of loneliness. Why? Because there is a legitimate desire and need in their life, but that need leads them to compromise their standards because it's so great. And, and we get this. This is the lie of discontentment. The lie of discontentment is I have to be the one to fulfill it. And when we can learn to trust in God and allow God in that season to secure our minds and hearts, then we will so often make wise decisions. We will be led by God to experience the best life possible. But when we have that, that desire, we open ourselves up to be manipulated. Like I think about, this is a weird thing, I'm not calling anyone a dog, but when I think about my dog, Bane, who it's my goal to give one story about Bane every single message, okay? So uh, my dog, Bane, who I, I love uh, so much, he's just this fierce furball of a dog. He's about 10 pounds and uh, he's, he thinks he's the alpha dog everywhere we go. So I love it. But anyway, Bane, you, obviously by your response, you guys don't care, so I'm gonna move on. But so Bane, every night, he, he, he sleeps upstairs, and so every night when we're getting ready for bed, uh, I have a rhythm. I take him outside so he can, you know, do his business so that he can get ready for bed. But to get him to come upstairs, he's not, like, he almost never will, if I say come here, he doesn't come here. I'm, we've never trained him to do that. It's one of my biggest regrets in life. Bane does what he wants to do. But I've learned this, that when I bring him in and I take off his harness and I put it away, he, there's a rhythm, and I open, I get a treat to give him. Once I have that treat in my hand, that dog obeys me. You know, like, and I don't even say like, follow me. I just have that treat in my hand. I shut it. I just start walking. I walk around the corner, walk up the stairs. And sure enough, that dude is following me, just bumping me the whole time up with his head. I walk right into the room where he's going to be. And then he sits down and I give him his treat. He is so locked in on that thing. He desires it so much that he will follow me anywhere. And I think that's the visual we need to have in our minds and hearts. When desire is that real in our lives, if the person who is holding out in front of us the treat, the one who says, I can fulfill that desire in your life, hear me, they're gonna control your life. And it's either gonna be God or it's gonna be a demonic force that's leading your life to destruction. God's not manipulating, so that's a weird analogy. God's not following us and, or just you know, egging us on. But when we recognize that God is the one at the very end of this journey that's saying, just trust me as my children that I love you and I'm gonna provide, when we have assurance in our hearts of that, when our faith is real, then we will fix our eyes on God and follow him in obedience. But when we don't have that conviction and we have the discontentment with God, what we will do is open up our lives to whoever else will hold that treat out and we'll follow them and they'll control our lives. And so I want everyone to take a moment and to think about if there's any area in your life that you're discontent. Are you discontent in your relationships? Are you discontent in your finances? Are you discontent in your health? Are you discontent in your purpose for life? Are you discontent in friendships and marriage? Are you discontent in whatever calling, whatever it might be? If you are discontent, I want you just to note that as an area for concern. It is a potential place of manipulation. And again, the reason why I say that is never to guilt or to shame, but so that we can look at that position and recognize the threat it is to the life God's called us to, so that we can turn to God to have him answer that. And so this is what I want to transition to now is to say, okay, so what's the solution? If we have the discontent, which we all have at times, what's the solution? Here's the solution. Turn to Matthew chapter six. These are the words of Jesus. In this story, this is, we, we actually spent many weeks this past year looking at the Sermon on the Mount. It's Jesus' first recorded sermon. He covers many different topics. At this point in the message, he begins to speak about money. But again, I want to remind you, though he is specifically talking about money, it's not just in their culture coins, it's, and in our culture, uh, pieces of paper. It's more broad than that. It's what money provides. But Jesus says this, and this is the most important things ever said about money, bar none. No one has ever said anything more important about money than these couple of verses. Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then this is the most important statement ever made about money. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That Jesus says your heart always follows treasure. 
Your heart will follow whatever it is that you value the most in your life and you invest your time and energy and treasures into. Jesus is acknowledging your heart follows that. And the reason why that's the most important thing is because this is what so often gets manipulated. We place in our minds a high value on things, and so we start to invest into it our monies and our resources, our time, energy, and talents, and our hearts naturally follow that. So what Jesus is acknowledging is you have two options. You can either invest your heart then into the world, which is temporary and has the potential for destruction and for things to be wasted away, or you can invest your heart into the things of God in a spiritual realm, and you are investing your heart into that relationship with God, and that relationship with God will lead you to the abundant life. Then Jesus, again, the very next verse, I'm not skipping any verses, in verse 22, he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So he, he uses some imagery here. He says, I want you to understand whatever it is, and he uses the imagery of the eye. Your eye is the lamp of the body. What he's saying is when he talks about the eye, he's talking about whatever it is that you focus on. Whatever it is that it becomes the priority in your life, he is declaring that whatever it is that you focus on that becomes the priority, it determines whether or not what's going on inside of you is healthy. If your eye is healthy, then there is light inside of you. Light in scripture always talks about God, his presence, his direction, his truth in your life. So he says, what you focus on will determine whether or not you are healthy inside of you. And so if you focus on your contentment, you focus on God, what's inside of you will become healthy. If you focus on something else and the discontentment, he goes, then what happens inside of you is actually darkness. But then he poses this question, and this is a sobering statement. He goes, if inside you is darkness, how great is the darkness? It is both a statement and a question. We can't possibly actually understand the darkness inside of us because we become numb to the conviction of God. We become numb to what he's trying to guide us to do. And so in our lives, when we focus on all these other things and say, God, you're not providing this and I'm gonna focus on this, it starts to put our hearts in such a dangerous position because not only is there darkness in our lives, but we lose the ability to be sensitive to the darkness. And so that darkness becomes the norm and it leads to greater levels of darkness. Then Jesus goes on. Once again, all of these are illustrating the same thing. No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You're gonna make the choice. You either serve God or you serve money. It either dominates or controls your life. One, one will. Verse 25, he goes, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? See, as Jesus begins to talk about money and the concept of storing up earthly treasure, he knew that the audience would immediately go to fear. They would go to worry because they would think, well, well then what, what, it, you know, if, if I don't have this and then that something goes bad in the culture and I you know, run out of money or whatever, like he knows they're gonna go to fear. And he goes, guys, here, I'm just gonna, so immediately he goes, don't be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious about these things. He starts to give him a couple of examples. So I'm going to skip some verses just for time's sake, but he goes, think about the birds. He's like, they don't have barns and yet God takes care of them. Think about the lily of the field. He said, it's more beautiful than any outfit anyone has ever created. God's the one who clothed it. He's like, are you not more precious than birds? Are you not more precious than, than flowers? And the obvious answer is yes. So then in verse 31, he says, therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. The Gentiles were the non-Jews. And at this point, they were not in a relationship with God. So what he's saying is people who are not in a relationship with God run after those things. People who are not in a relationship with God, they worry, they stress, they're discontent. But people who are in a relationship with God don't need to be that way. Why? Because God knows exactly what you need. Now, everyone hear this. This is the most obvious statement I'll make, but you need to just hear and be reminded of it. God loves you. God knows what you need. 
God has a plan for your life. He knows what is needed in that plan. God is never early. He's never late. He's always perfectly on time. God knows exactly where he's leading your life. But the only way we get to a place of fully trusting that is to trust him and walk in obedience. And so Jesus is challenging me. He goes, guys, if you're in a relationship with God, you don't need to stress about these things. God is leading you on a purposed plan. But then Jesus, and this is where it's all leading in verse 33, he makes a profound statement that we so often miss this. And I'm going to explain it, but he goes in verse 33. So all the things he just said, don't worry all that. He goes, instead of worrying, but seek First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that you're stressed about, all these things will be added to you. Let me say it again. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. This is the second truth and I'm gonna give it to you then I'll explain it. You don't become content with God by mastering your mind and heart. You become content through purpose, physical and spiritual behavior. I think sometimes when we think about the idea of contentment, we almost view it as something that can happen like passively, that as we just kind of relax in life and take some deep breaths, almost like a a Buddhist mindset, this Zen-like mindset that if I can learn to just center myself and to relax and take some deep breaths, that I'll be content with God. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. He doesn't say the way that you experience contentment is just to relax. He doesn't say just take five deep breaths. He doesn't say to meditate, and I'm not even making fun of those things. He's just saying that's not the way to do it. The way, and everyone hear me, because if you miss this, you'll miss the whole truth of this. The way you become content with God is through purpose, physical decisions that you make and and spiritual decisions that you make. He says, here's what you first do. So again, this is all in the context of trusting him, not going to worry. He goes, here's what you first do. Seek first the kingdom of God. What does that mean? It means in your life, make it the priority and purpose of your life that in your behavior, you're going to do what is best for God's kingdom to advance. So you're going to make a decision to honor God in every critical area of your life. So when you look at your time, if you're making decisions in your calendar, it begins by wrestling with the question, what can I do with my time to advance the kingdom of God? When you're looking at your energy and your talents, how can I use my energy and my talents to advance the kingdom of God? When you look at it in your finances, before you make any other financial decision, you begin with, how can I use my finances to advance the kingdom of God? It is a very physical thing that you're doing that has a spiritual motivation, but it is in these behaviors that your heart begins to be shaped to follow God and to align your desires with God. Because as you start to operate in the physical with your time, your talents, your energy, your resources, it is in that moment that you are investing your heart into a relationship with God. And in that moment, God begins to change and shape and modify your desires to align with him. And it breaks away the temptations and the deception of the world so that you can experience true contentment with him. But he goes, it doesn't just simply begin with seeking first the kingdom of God. It also continues and his righteousness, which means you're making purpose decisions in your life to live in such a way that honors God in your behavior of being holy. As we looked at a couple of weeks ago, the idea of of God setting a standard and we're saying, I'm going to live differently because this is the life that God calls me to. And so I'm going to live a life of honesty. I'm going to live a life of generosity. I'm going to live a moral life. I'm going to live a life of purity. And what God, Jesus himself, God in the flesh promises is that when you make it the priority of your life to do these physical and spiritual things of seeking first his kingdom, seeking first his righteousness, that when you make that a priority, his promise is you will be content in God. You will not worry. You will not be stressed because he will do a miracle in your heart. And note this as a side blessing and benefit to this. When you walk in obedience, God promises you to bless you in that area. 
And so when you surrender your time, your talents, your energy, your finances to God, it is a promise in scripture that he will bless you in those areas. When you seek God and his righteousness and you begin to live in obedience, God promises to bring blessing upon your life. You cannot read any commands in scripture that does not come with it a promise of God's blessing. And so when you do these things of seeking first his kingdom, seeking first his righteousness, you will be blessed. And I promise you, friends, that when you you live that lifestyle and experience the blessing of God, it is in that condition, it's easy to be content with God. And this is what he's communicating. This is what he's challenging us with. Let me show you a couple more examples of this. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12. So we're going back to Paul here. I'm going to go through these really quickly just to show you. Paul, following God, called by God, Paul has a condition Uh, He calls it a thorn in the flesh. This has been debated since Paul wrote these words. My personal conviction is it's a physical problem. I think it had something to do with his eyes. Many people debate it. It doesn't really matter. But he has something that he just had, he called a thorn in his flesh, something that was like tormenting him. He says, so to keep me, this is verse seven, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Know what he says here, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. This is what he realized, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Let me just summarize this to you. Paul had a condition that caused him to be discontent with God. He had a thorn in the flesh. Note how he worded it. He three different times pleaded with God for this thorn to be removed from his flesh. He wasn't talking about in a literal sense of an actual thorn. He was talking about something figurative. But three different times. And, And don't get the idea that he did this like in a row where he sat down to pray and he said, God, will you remove it? God, will you remove it? God, will you remove it? It's more of in three seasons of his life, this ongoing struggle with God, Paul was discontent. He didn't want the thorn in his flesh. He didn't want to be in that condition. But in, as he explains it, he also gives you his strategy and his solution. So what did he do with those three times? He went to God and he pleaded with God, a physical and spiritual response. He prayed, he sought God. He engaged God. He talked to God. He wrestled with God. I mean, this is the idea of what Paul is saying. I pleaded with God for him to take it away. And God said, my grace is sufficient. When Paul first heard that answer, he was like, no, it's not. He was discontent with that answer. No. Why do I know that? Because he went back to God to wrestle again. So the first time I'm discontent, I'm wrestling. Second time I'm wrestling. I'm discontent. Third time I'm wrestling. But it was somewhere after that third time that this truth became real to Paul where he realized, you know what? What I thought was a thorn in the flesh that was wounding and hurting me, here's what I realized. God showed me that God actually allowed it to protect me because if I didn't have it, this would have caused me to become conceited. Now think about this. Paul, this, again, as I say this, we just talked about this as a staff this week, a few of us. Paul is potentially the second most influential person who has ever lived next to Jesus. And we might not have ever known the name of Paul if he didn't have a thorn in his flesh because he might have become conceited and who knows what that would have happened in his life. So this moment of discontentment from his logical perspective, it's obvious I shouldn't have this. His loving father in heaven says, no, I need you to have this because this is gonna keep you humble, Paul, and it's gonna allow you to be used by me to experience the abundant life. What was the outcome? Paul goes, here's what I learned. When I am weak, he is strong. I learned that I can be content because God has a plan. Paul, again, Philippians 4, go there quickly. Paul says in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. So he says here, this is where he begins. Find your joy in God. Make a, a physical response, a spiritual response. Rejoice in God. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. Anxious. Do not be discontent. I mean, this is the imagery, right? Don't be anxious about anything. Stop there. Paul says, don't be anxious. I I want you to hear me. If someone says you don't be anxious, does that make you any less anxious? It's like that famous line I've heard, like, it's when someone tells you to calm down. (laughs) Like, no one has ever calmed down in the history of calming down by someone telling them to calm down, right? It's like the same thing. If, If you're stressed and someone says, 
don't be anxious, don't be stressed. You're like, oh, thanks for that piece of wisdom there, right? But that's not where Paul ends. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but then gives you the solution. But in everything, so in every form of anxiousness, this is what he's saying, this is a context. In, in your discontentment, whenever it is it's causing, okay, in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That is a physical and spiritual thing. I'm going to pray. I'm going to surrender it to God, okay? And this is the result. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on and says, here's another physical thing you can do. Again, in the context of discontentment, of anxiousness. Finally, brothers, this is what you need to do, okay? Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. He goes on and says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. Again, physical and spiritual. Do something physical and spiritual to respond to the discontentment and the God of peace will be with you. He goes on and says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need. Now, now note this, what he's about to say, because this is followed with the most misquoted verse in the Bible. <laughs> second, second most misquoted. I know how to be brought low. This is Paul. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. And in every, any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Okay, so Paul goes, I can be, have everything or have nothing and I've learned how to be content in this, okay? And then the, probably the most misquoted, second most misquoted verse. I'll tell you the first one later. The, the first, second most misquoted verse is this, ready? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We always say this verse and we say it in the complete opposite of how Paul meant it. We go, I don't have something right now that I want, but here's the good news. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? I, I, didn't, I didn't get that promotion or I want that promotion. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, I want that relationship. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I want to make that sports team. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, and that's how we take it. But actually, it's the opposite. What Paul is actually saying is when I don't get the job and I don't get the relationship and I don't make the team and I don't get what my heart desires, I can still be content in God. You know how? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul's actually saying the opposite of how we use this verse. But what Paul is saying is I can do that. I can be content. I can be satisfied. Let me go to one last example and then we'll close today. Let's go back to where we began today in 1 Timothy chapter 6. I told you I'd come back to this verse. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Everyone look at me for a second. Contentment happens first with godliness. Godliness is a purpose decision that you make in your life. A decision to seek first the kingdom of God, to seek first his righteousness. That's when you experience godliness. And Paul's like, you know what? You can be content in your life. And everyone hear me. You can be content in sin. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, you can be content in your life not obeying God. You can be content not following the pathways of God. That's not what Paul is saying. He's like, godliness with contentment is great gain. Doing the things that honor God, this is, this is how you experience contentment in your life, obeying God. And in this verse, Paul goes, okay, godliness with contentment is great gain. And he starts talking about the love of money and how it leads people into temptation and destruction and ruin. And then right after it, he says this verse, and we did not read this earlier. He says in verse 11, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. So in the middle of this, where he's saying discontentment can lead you away from God, he sandwiches it with action, physical and spiritual. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You, he's talking to Timothy, you man of God, flee the things that could cause you to walk away from God. Flee, run away from the things, the discontentment that can lead to manipulation and instead pursue the things that will just align your heart with God. So this is where I wanna to conclude today. As you think about the areas in your life where you're discontent, that's controlling your life. Here's what I know, for people who most often don't honor God in some area of their life, it's, it's because it's being controlled in another area. And so when you think about your discontentment, you think about this condition, 
It is impossible to experience and to live the holy life that God calls you to unless you surrender it all to him. It's impossible to experience the truth of contentment with God if you don't start honoring him in a physical and spiritual way in all the areas that are important, your time, your energy, your talents, your, your resources, and surrendering that to God. And so I want all of you just to take a moment and to bow your heads. And I want you to think about whatever it is in your life right now that you know you're discontent in. Whatever it is that I, I hope today that you see has become an open door for manipulation. As you think about this, I'll say it again, I don't ever teach with the primary goal to be guilt or shame. We teach because the areas in our lives that are potential for destruction are also areas that are potential for restoration in life. As you look at this area, I, I want you today to surrender it to God. If it's a relationship you desire, surrender it to God. If it's finances and resources, surrender it to God. If it's something in between, surrender it to God. Jesus, will you help us in this endeavor? Will you help us to realize that the discontentment in our life, it's not leading us toward good things. It's opening our hearts and our lives to be manipulated. Will you help us to understand this truth so that we can make purpose, physical and spiritual decisions to align our lives with you? We wanna be content. We wanna be secure in the abundant life that you offer, but we need your help. So as we surrender this to you, will you empower us through your spirit and God always, we give you the glory. We pray this in your precious name, amen.